Welcome to Social Distance Assistance. I'm Kelly. And I'm June. And this is our last episode of Social Distance Assistance. For now. Right. It's not like we're done looking for helpers, or even anywhere close to done with this crisis. But when we started the show, we had no idea how long we'd be at it. I figured, here's something for us to do during the day. I'll wrap homeschooling into my podcast job, and we will inform and entertain this bird, that's you, June, with one stone. It totally worked while we were in the holding pattern of the last few months. But to quote Dr. Ian Malcolm... Not a real doctor. Life... Uh, finds a way. So, life now means school's out, virtual musical theater camp is in, and I've got a lot more podcast projects I want to share with the world. Sadly, we cannot do it all. So we're going to set social distance assistance aside for a while. Maybe we'll pick it back up someday. I'd like that. I mean, who knows what school will look like in the fall, right? Maybe I'll have to take podcast classes again. It is incredibly likely. The only thing that seems for sure right now, and something that we've known since we started this project, is that there's no going back to normal. We have a little bit more sense of what the new normal would look like. Mandatory mask wearing. Staying six feet away from people who aren't in your immediate social pod. Lots of takeout, not a lot of dining in. Grappling with the social inequities that were exposed when we were all exposed to the virus. Lots of difficult discussions with friends and family about isolation, mental health, and safety. The new normal doesn't sound fun. But as we know from doing 14 weeks of a show about coronavirus helpers, we're not alone. We're all going through this together, and we're going to come out on the other side, even if that looks really different from where we've been. Today's theme is... Recovery. We'll talk to a nurse who had COVID-19 about what it felt like, about the recovery process, and about what it's like to be back at work. We'll also look into the future and think about what kind of help the world will need in the coming months and years. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Ahmed Badr. I'm the host of VPM's new podcast, Resettled. It highlights the stories of refugees as they resettle in Virginia and the milestone moments that shape their experience. In this six-part series, we break down what resettlement actually looks like through humbling moments of surprise to the challenges of adjusting to a new home. And we explore tough questions, like how do we grow when we're starting over? Check out Resettled wherever you get your podcasts. Letha Mullins is a 29-year-old registered nurse living in southern West Virginia. When she was diagnosed with COVID-19 earlier this year, she was working as a travel nurse on assignment in Lexington, Kentucky. On March 20th, I went out for my 15-minute break at work and became extremely short of breath and developed a cough. About three and a half hours after I was home, I spiked a temperature of 102, and immediately, it was instantaneous. I could not breathe. By the time I made it to urgent care, I was in respiratory distress. I could not speak three or four words without having to gasp for air. It felt like... There was pressure all around my lungs preventing them from expanding the way they should, and it felt like I was inhaling and exhaling through dense cotton. Letha has a few pre-existing conditions that made her especially vulnerable to COVID. She has autoimmune disorders, and she's a smoker. But she says she was feeling fine before her diagnosis. The autoimmune conditions were under control. And then all of a sudden, it felt like somebody took my lungs away from me. 
On the day that I had symptoms and I knew that I had to go get tested, I went to a, um, I think it's called Kentucky Urgent Care. I had called them prior to going because I knew that if what I was experiencing was COVID-19, I needed to take proper measures to decrease my exposure. So I drove myself there in respiratory distress. No idea how I made it there safely, but I did. The medical assistant came to my vehicle in full personal protective equipment, the gown, the face mask, the face shield, got my vital signs right there in my car. The following Tuesday after I'd gotten tested, I was at home, and at about 9.30 p.m., I received a call from the urgent care. It was one of their representatives, and he started the conversation out by asking me, have you been anywhere What's the last five days been like? How have you been feeling? There was a sense of urgency in his voice that I picked up on very quickly. And I said, no, I'm not answering any more of your questions until you tell me whether or not I am COVID-19 positive. And he said, yes, unfortunately, you are COVID-19 positive. As a nurse, to know that I have a virus that could have potentially been deadly, that I could have spread to my coworkers and my mother, it, it was the worst feeling emotionally I've ever felt. The first five days of my illness were definitely the hardest. On day five, I remember specifically, it felt like my body was giving up and trying to decide, do we want to fight or do we want to give up? I could tell that this virus had put a strain on my body. And apart from my body, it put such a strain on my mind because it's a, it's a very isolated feeling. And to be alone and think, this virus could kill me is one of the most mentally and emotionally strenuous things I have ever been through. And as a nurse, we go through, you know, mental and emotional anguish all the time. You know, I was wondering what, if something were to happen to me, what would my mom do without me? You know, cause I'm, it's just me and my mom in most of the time. And wondering, am I going to be able to avoid the hospital? Am I going to end up on a ventilator? The, you know, what are my patients going to do without me? It's, I, I cannot convey in any manner how that feels. Lisa was quarantined for 18 days. She was mostly laid out on the couch and played a lot of video games. A couple of friends sent her some takeout. There wasn't any treatment for her. She said doctors told her to lie low and if things got really bad, to go to the ER. Eventually, she started to come out of it. Her mandated quarantine time was coming to an end. And it was time to start thinking about going back to work. Our producer, Molly... Talked to Letha early on in her recovery for a story that aired on West Virginia Public Broadcasting. On April 9th, Letha sent Molly a voice memo as she was driving to work on her second shift post-COVID. My first night back to work was, um, it was familiar, but yet strange at the same time. At first, I was nauseated. I was scared. <clears throat> I was questioning whether I even needed to be there. I was questioning how productive I could even be. And I wanted to run. I wanted to just come back home and say, you know, I'm not ready for this. But I stayed because running away from something doesn't make it go away. It just makes it come back later. So I was exhausted. <laughs> and today, I'm getting my stuff together right now to go back and do it a second night. And I'm not feeling as nervous, but I am still very exhausted, very tired. So I think I'm okay. I think that I'm going to be fine. I just have to do it. I told myself while I had COVID-19 that I had to live. And now I'm telling myself I have to do this because this is who I am. This is what I do. And this is this was my life before COVID. I will not allow COVID to take that away from me because I'm a nurse and that's what I do and that's what I do best. So it's it took away a lot of things. It's not going to take this away. I'm not going to allow it. 
Since then, Letha has stopped working as a travel nurse. She moved back home to West Virginia full-time, got a stationary nursing job, and has plans to go back to school to become a nurse practitioner. It's been just over three months since she first had COVID symptoms. So we called her up to reflect on recovery and how she's moving forward. And do you feel different now physically since you've recovered? Oh, I absolutely feel different physically. Now, when I shower, I have to be very mindful about leaving the door open to let fresh air in. Because if I shut the door, yeah, if I shut the door and it gets warm and steamy in there, I can't breathe to the point that I feel like I'm going to pass out. I'll literally have to sit down on the side of the bathtub and catch my breath. So I've adapted to leave the door open and leave the shower curtain cracked a little bit so I get that continuous fresh air so I can breathe easier. And I never had to do that before. And I did do a follow-up chest x-ray and the doctor said, you know, we can't even tell that you ever had COVID. So even though we can't see a pathology on an x-ray, my symptoms that I'm still struggling with say that there's some pathology occurring. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask because you had said earlier, you know, you wanted answers as a nurse, like right away. You're like, okay, what are my kidneys doing? What are what are my lungs doing? What's my heart doing? Yes. I mean, apart from just routine lab work and a follow up chest x-ray, there's still not been any kind of real research. Like I'm an opportunity and it is very frustrating to me that I am a missed opportunity to learn more because, you know, how does this how does COVID affect people with autoimmune disorders? I have, you know, I have three that are diagnosed right now. How how has it affected me? And how how did that progression occur? Are you coming into contact with COVID patients now? To my knowledge, no. Uh, the place where I work now is... Um, It's a long-term care skilled nursing facility, and I'm on what they call their COVID unit, which is where any new admit comes in. They have to be held for two weeks. And to my knowledge, none of those um, patients that I've been taking care of since starting my new job have it. Coming back to work after just having COVID, I'm not even going to say I was recovered, like just having an active case of COVID, it was... I don't even know how to describe that feeling and imagine that, you know, you're in the firing line and a bullet just grazes you somewhere and you have to go sit out on the sideline, get patched up. And then as soon as you get patched up, they say, okay, go back out there and potentially get fired upon again. It was literally like, wow, I just got hit with this. And I just got to the point where someone deemed it okay that I could return to work. And now I'm right, right where I can get it again. And at that point, we didn't know, you know, could you get it a second time? What happens if you do? Are you more vulnerable? Are you less vulnerable? More at risk, less at risk. You just, we didn't know any of that information. And do you have more answers now? Are you likely to get it again? Or I was operating under the assumption that I could get it again. And then that research came out and it said, oh, well, you probably can't get it again. Just like everything from the beginning, it's been a roller coaster of one research article comes out and I'm like, oh gosh, I have immunity. And then research will come out and they're like, oh, well, you actually can get it again. And then I'm right back into, oh gosh, what happens when I get it again? And is that why you don't consider yourself, you know, quote unquote, recovered? Um, I don't consider myself recovered because I don't feel the same as I did. When I get to the point where I no longer feel like I'm passing out when I shower, I'll say, okay, I'm recovered. And I still have a lot of fatigue. The fatigue has been the absolute worst remaining symptom of COVID. I'm still very fatigued. If I overexert myself to a point, I'm, I'm done. I just have to lay down, catch my breath. So I'm finding that A lot of the things that I could just get up and do, snip, you know, snap, snap, get up and go. I'm having to take a lot more time to be mindful of my physical health in order to do those things. So for me to consider myself recovered, it's when I get at least to the point where I feel pre-COVID normal. But we don't know. Is this my new normal? I hope not. (laughs) Do you feel like 
you have to be some kind of ambassador for helping people understand coronavirus? And and if so, does that feel weird? Like like a task that you didn't ask for that you have to provide anyway? No, no, I don't. I don't feel like I have to or that I'm obligated or anything like that. I feel like my experience with COVID was I felt very, very isolated. And just like with most things that you go through that are very stressful, you're left wondering, you know, is this just me? Is there anyone out there going through this as well? So in my mind, doing these interviews and talking about it and being open gives me an opportunity to potentially reach someone who has experienced it as well and is sitting home right now wondering, am I the only one dealing with this? Is this normal? What should I be scared of? How should I feel? This is an opportunity for me to reach out to that person and say, you are not alone. And my name is Letha Mullins. And if you need answers or you just want to talk, I've went through that similar situation. I just want people to feel like it's okay. You had said you think that you'll feel recovered when not just when your life gets back to normal, but when you're not as tired anymore. Um, Have you noticed a change over time? Like you you said you were really fatigued. Are you getting less fatigued? Are you hopeful about when that future is going to come? I'm not. To me, being hopeful is to be optimistic. And I find that optimism clouds reality. So I'm very, you know, I live in the realm of realism. I try not to anticipate anything or hope for anything because then I'm expecting something. And if you expect something and it doesn't happen, you become very let down. And I'm, you know, this whole experience has been a very emotionally fragile experience. So I try very much not to look forward to anything. I just take it when I can, as I can. Do you get pissed off at all about oh people going to bars and not wearing masks if you want to put yourself and everyone around you at risk I have no respect for you I was told that if I left my apartment the premises where I was at in Lexington I would be charged with domestic terrorism and when I see people that are like Oh, I don't want to wear a mask because I don't have to. This illness isn't as bad as you think it is. People who completely disregard the illness, you know, COVID as being anything serious. Oh, it's just another flu. The media the media hypes it up. It's fear propaganda. If I don't want to wear a mask, I don't have to. Herd immunity. That's what pisses me off about people who just run around and completely call it bullcrap. Almost cut. I almost cuss because I get real mad about it. That's what that's what makes me mad because I'm sitting here like, oh, I had it. Like that completely just says to me, I don't care that you had it or what you went through. You're a liar. It invalidates your experience. Don't dismiss it. If you have your own views and opinions about it and you've never had it and you never know anyone that have it, you just need to take a seat and shut up or go talk to someone who's dealt with it and get a perspective. That's how I feel about it. And not a lot of people have a mouth like me that can say that and deal with the bombardment that, could, you know, the backlash of saying that. And I that people need to know it's OK. And if I'm that voice to reach to that person and say it is OK, you're you be pissed off. These people are all crazy. You're not. Then that that's what this is. This is my goal. I am. I am you. I'm not a celebrity. I'm not part of the CDC or the government. I am a 29-year-old lifelong resident of West Virginia. You know, I'm very proud to be from West Virginia, and I'm very proud of my roots. But right now isn't the time for pride. Right now is the time for consideration. And we should consider each other and how we are affecting each other. You know, my family is your family. My family is everyone else's family. And we need to protect each other right now more than anything. We 
We've all heard that classic piece of dinner party advice. Whatever you do, just don't bring up religion. But we lose so much when we don't talk about religion. Religion can unite us. It can divide us. And it shapes the world around us in all sorts of unexpected ways. Sacred and Profane is a podcast that isn't afraid to tackle religion. From a Rwandan man trying to help his neighbors heal after genocide to a Hare Krishna community in West Virginia wrestling with fracking on their land. These stories explore how religion changes everything. Sacred and Profane is produced by the Religion, Race, and Democracy Lab at the University of Virginia. Catch season two now on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Radio Public. We have talked to so many inspiring helpers on this show. From our first long interview with Dr. Lindsay Neal, who taught us about the importance of wearing masks, to my favorite interview with Leslie the Bat Lady. We thought we'd check back in with some of our helpers to see what they're up to now, whether their help has changed at all, and how they're imagining the future. Hello, this is Scott Klumke. I'm the pastor at Mount Calvary Lutheran Church in Johnstown. You last heard from me when this podcast was covering unusual approaches to the celebration of Easter. We were the church that had two Easter services at a local drive-in. Hello, everyone. This is Alfonso. Um, I'm an artist based in Richmond. And I was on the show talking about my drawing project called Green Portraits. Hello, this is Darlene from Casa Q, and I was on your show in May. I was talking about putting on a farm worker caravan, and since then, we've done a couple more. We've gone to Salinas, and then we went to San Juan Baptista. Stay tuned. Go to hashtag farm worker caravan, and you can see what we're go- going on there. And for the past three weeks now, we've been transitioning back to worship in the congregation. We're probably back to worshiping at about 67%, two-thirds of where we were before the onset of COVID-19. We've also picked up uh, new members uh, who uh, came across us through these drive-in services and were fed and impressed by what they encountered. It feels like uh, the conversation has changed a lot from what was happening a while ago, a month ago, at least with with COVID and now with this uh, social justice situation and and everything that happened after George Floyd. Um, Something from post-COVID world, I hope, is to have people making more authentic decisions, and I'm including myself there. Just acknowledging what we really want to do in life and and maybe also knowing the things that we don't need to do or, or don't have to focus so much on that. I hope we as a society can perhaps get behind the divisions that are so tiring and draining these days. It would be nice if we could create a culture in which there was room for science and fact as, as well as room for personal creativity and opinion and room for places of faith as well as places of strict reason, places of of non-belief. We really, I think, uh, need to come together uh, as a society and a community and uh, learn from all the dysfunction uh, we've been experiencing. Hey, this is Rabbi Patrick. I'm the spiritual leader for Kahila, the independent progressive Jewish community here in Richmond. And I was on the show talking about celebrating Passover online with my congregation. Wild times, right? This is Lisa Woolfork. I am an associate professor at the University of Virginia, and I came to you for the social distance assistance episode on making masks because I am an avid sewist as well as a podcast host of the Stitch Please podcast. Hey, this is Kestrel. I use she, her pronouns, and I was on the show talking about my app, The Validation Station. Just a quick update. This past month, I've been working on everything I can to try and help LGBTQ plus people feel less isolated. It feels great to be doing something to help. 
Hey, it's Dave Russell from Warmoto 3.3. I was on the show talking about our virtual prom. Just wanted to give you a quick update. So we're still broadcasting from home, and it doesn't look like that's going to be changing any time before September. This has become the new normal. I have made about maybe 25, 30 masks since we spoke about this issue. My feelings haven't changed that much. Um, I still do not like making masks, even though I understand that these are absolutely essential items. I am an avid mask wearer. I like wearing masks far more than I like making them. This past month, we've been putting together Shabbat at home kits that include our Rebbitzin's homemade challah bread, Shabbat candles, little (laughs) juice boxes for the wine blessing, and some upbeat spiritual literature. It makes the Friday night Sabbath experience a little more enjoyable than just plopping down and re-watching Netflix, right? Or at least we hope so. But I can't wait for the world to open up a little more so that I can start getting out and meeting people face to face. I would love to teach my students in person, but I don't, I'm not sure if it's safe to do so. Sending my own kids back to school is another concern. Um, I think that masks is an essential part of that. I would prefer if we were able to get higher quality PPE for people who are going to be in contact with young people. Um, as well as for the young people themselves. So that's where I am right now. I really hope that we can build a better world post-COVID, one where people love each other more, love the environment more, and that we can keep reducing hate as much as we can. I think what we're seeing is a real uncovering of what life is like for many people. My hope is that the changes we have to make to survive as a human family will happen sooner than later, and I hope our leaders will be blessed with wisdom and courage. But alas, um, I just don't see that happening. So in the meantime, we do what we can, uh, even if that means dropping bags of bread and prayer books at people's front doors. Hi, my name is Magali Licoli. I am the director and co-founder of Venceremos. This past month has been really busy. We have organized a car caravan uh, fighting for the human rights of poultry workers. And just recently, we have a march in downtown Springdale, headquarters of Tyson Foods. We were demanding the shutdowns of poultry plants without breaks. Hi, this is Koshin. And Chodo. We are the co-founders of the New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care. We were on an earlier show talking about intimacy, love, and grief in the time of COVID. Hey, this is Lawrence Bartley. I'm the director of News Inside for the Marshall Project. I was on the show talking about the coronavirus and the challenges to social distancing in prison. In this past month, we've been meeting the increased need for community support as well as online training for our frontline workers in resilience and compassion. We have expanded our online bereavement group, supporting people through the country and internationally. And we're preparing for our contemplative care trainings, expanding them to be available online beginning in October. To be able to serve the world in these times is an honor and is nourishing for the soul. This past month, I've also been working on News Inside Issue 5. Currently, it it feels like I'm on the cusp of something great externally as it relates to journalism. There's something new that I'm involved with working on, and, and I'm grateful to be a part of it. We feel so overwhelmed and concerned for our communities, but we also are really hopeful that we are seeing a lot of people joining our movement that will bring about change. We need to change our current reality so that we create the world that we want to create after COVID-19. We know that this work can be done if we continue fighting, and we know that we will win. Venceremos. I hope that once this COVID era is over, we begin to reopen. We we take those lessons and and uh, that we learn from being sheltering in place and using technology, and we morph that with all the greatness of not having to social distance, and we we make a, a better world during this post COVID nineteen era. What we wish for once this pandemic is over is a world where people treat each other with respect 
and dignity. And that each person can live in a community that fully supports them. Sending blessings to you all. To you all. Be well. So this is the end of the episode and also the temporary, maybe, end of the show. And I just want to say, June, that I am super, so awesomely, incredibly proud of you. It's a big deal to keep working through a pandemic when you're a grown up. Trust me, it is exhausting and stressful and emotional. And a lot of the time, I just want to lie in bed and do absolutely nothing. You're eight, though, and you took on a whole new job that you've never done before with energy and mostly good vibes. This was supposed to be a project where I helped you learn about the world, right? I was like, Mr. Rogers is this guy, and he says, go look for the helpers. I'm going to be like him, and I'm going to show you all of the helpers. But in reality, I think you actually helped me get through this, and doing this project with you helped me a lot. So thanks. You're welcome. What about you? Are you uh, looking forward to a time where you don't have to go into the closet with mom and have me <laughs> make you repeat script over and over and over again. Yeah, it is also incredibly hot in here. <laughs> it's true. But what are you going to miss about the show? I've just really liked getting to know a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. It feels like amazing to have people to talk to during this crisis. Is that because you sort of feel cut off from friends and family, and so it feels good to meet new folks? Yeah. It makes me feel not alone. Mm -hmm. Like, it makes me remember that there's a lot of people who just want this to be over, mm -hmm. who just, like, are, like, trying to help in the best ways that they can. We also can't uh, wrap this up without saying an enormous thank you to Molly Bourne, our producer, without whom none of this would have happened. We could not have done it. And who I'm so grateful to have in my life. Um, and I can't wait to just keep talking to her and someday hang out for real and have a beer. Not for you, though. You don't get to. You can have a Shirley Temple. Yeah, I'll have a Shirley Temple. I'll just sit on the side while you guys talk about your jobs and I'll just drink my Shirley Temple and read a book or draw some pictures or something that sounds amazing I'm very excited for that time and that's our show for today Social Distance Assistance is produced and engineered by June Harcastle Robinson Jones Kelly Jones and Molly Bourne it was created and edited by Nate Toby Gavin Wright made it all happen digital assistance from Angela Messino and the VPM News team Steve Humble is VPM's chief content officer. Music for this week's episode came from Blue Dot Sessions. Special thanks to West Virginia Public Broadcasting for tape of the first interview with Letha Mullins. And many thanks to all of our freelancers throughout the season. Gabrielle, Sonia, Nina, Hans, Maria Luisa, and Laura. Members are a fundamental part of VPM. Member support is especially vital right now. Through member support, we are able to provide timely and fact-based information, educational resources for our kids, and informative and entertaining content to keep minds active and engaged. Be a part of what makes VPM possible. Visit vpm.org slash donate to become a member today. Okay, so technically the show's over, but I wanted to pop in here really quick and tell you about something else I've been working on with VPM. A new podcast hosted by Kadada Williams called Seizing Freedom. It's about how Black people fought to secure their own freedom during the Civil War and fought to determine what that freedom meant during Reconstruction. Freedom isn't just something you get. It's something that's built over time through a billion daily practices. So on Seizing Freedom, we actually hear directly from people who lived through the late 19th century. We use diaries, letters, speeches, and newspapers to bring you stories on the ground. Stories of black soldiers, refugees, entrepreneurs, teachers, and politicians. The full season of the show drops in the fall of 2020. 
But here's the trailer for Seizing Freedom. Subscribe now wherever you get your podcasts. Remember that in a contest with oppression, the Almighty has no attribute which can take sides with oppressors. People think that Abraham Lincoln alone ended slavery. Southern soldiers were the first to open fire, which was returned by the Yanks, and the fight was on. And that Congress alone rewrote the U.S. Constitution. Can this nation that has advanced so rapidly in the cause of freedom go backwards so much so as to re-enslave a people that have assisted in fighting its battles? Forbid it, justice. Forbid it, humanity. But the truth is, we helped end slavery. I went to him and asked him to let me enlist, but he said it wasn't a black man's war. I told him it would be a black man's war before they got through. And afterwards, and against all odds, we played a starring role reconstructing the nation and extending freedom to all. I shall die a trying for our rights so that the other that are born hereafter may live and enjoy a happy life. From VPM, it's Seizing Freedom. I'm your host, Kadada Williams. On this show, you'll hear epic stories of Black people who fought for their liberty and transformed America during Reconstruction. We dug into the archives to bring you their stories in their own words. Everything you hear on this show is from diaries, letters, newspapers, and speeches that document how Black soldiers, teachers, entrepreneurs, and politicians seized their own freedom and political power, though it wouldn't last. All we ask for is equal justice, the same that is accorded to all other races who come to this country of their free will, not forced to as we were, while we are denied what is rightfully our own in a country which the labor of our forefathers helped to make what it is. Subscribe to Seizing Freedom today, wherever you get your podcasts. VPM. 